All right, everybody, welcome back to our study of the book of Esther. In this episode, we're going to take chapter 2. And so let's jump right into the first four verses. We're going to see a search is made for this replacement for Queen Vashti. Verse 1. After these things, when the wrath of King Xerxes subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan the, Citad- the citadel, into the women's quarters, under the, the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women. And let beauty preparations be given to them. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. And so after these things, this is a this is broader than just the events of the previous chapter. Uh, Esther chapter 2 verse 16 will indicate that there was a four-year span between chapters 1 and 2. During that time, King Xerxes made his great unsuccessful invasion of Greece, and he came home a defeated man. We're going to talk all through that. And he wanted to cheer his heart through sensual diversions here. And so the plan was to assemble a harem from the most beautiful women of the land, to bring them into a harem for the king, and to choose the most favored women to be his queen from that group. This was sort of a Miss Persian Empire contest, and the winner would be queen instead of Vashti. And so the ancient Jewish historian Josephus says that Xerxes had a total of 400 women selected here. And so the wrath of King Xerxes. So between chapters 1 and 2, there's at least four years that pass during which Xerxes went on his disastrous Greek campaign from 481 to 479 B.C. And so these Greco-Persian battles at 490 B.C. had the Battle of Marathon. 480 B.C. had the Battle of Thermopylae. You'll remember from the movie 300. 480 B.C. the Battle of Salamis. And 479 the Battle of Placia. And so the Battle of Marathon, this battle took place between the Greeks and Persians at Marathon, a plain on Athenian territory that's 25 miles northeast of Athens. And so in 490 BC, Herodotus presents the campaign as having been initiated against the Greek cities of Athens and Eresria by Darius I in revenge for their support of a revolt within the Persian Empire of the Ionian Greek cities of Asia Minor in 499 to 494 BC. At the same time, he portrays the Persian motive as the conquest of the whole of Greece. The Persians, some 90,000, far outnumbered the Greeks at 10,000. According to Herodotus, the dead numbered um, 192 Athenians to 6,400 Persians. So pretty significant. So the Battle of Thermopylae. And so Thermopylae, uh, or the hot gates in the Greek, That's the name of the pass taken from the hot sulfur springs in the vicinity. It was the scene of the first major battle that was fought during the invasion of Greece that Xerxes led between 480 and 479 BC. Xerxes' campaign was motivated partly by the desire to avenge the Greeks' defeat of the Persians at the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC and partly by ambition for imperial expansion. So even before the Battle of Thermopylae, Xerxes had already won over large parts of Greece through both diplomatic initiative and the threat of force. The remaining Greeks, under the leadership of Sparta, they abandoned the uh, Thessalian frontier and they made a stand instead at the pass of Thermopylae at the hot gates. So Thermopylae was the main route by which an invading army could penetrate from the north into southern Greece. In ancient times, it was narrow track about 50 feet wide, passing under a cliff. Again, in 191 BC, the Seleucid king Antiochus III, the Great, was defeated while attempting to check the Romans at this point as well. And so, while regarded as an exaggeration, Herodotus indicates that the Persians numbered 2.6 million against 7,000 Greeks. Thermopylae won eternal fame as the scene of a heroic death of Leonidas I and his 1,400 men, including the fabled 300 of whom were Spartans. And so the Greeks were betrayed by um, Ephelatus, a Thessalian, into the hands of the Persians, who, by following a path over the mountain, they attacked the Greeks from the rear. And so the Persians went on to take Athens, but later in 480 BC, the Greek navy defeated them at the Battle of Salamis, halting Xerxes' advance on Greece, and it put an end to his imperial ambitions. 
And so the Battle of Sal uh, Salamis, an important Greek naval victory in 480 BC, which occurred in the strait near the island of Salamis, not far from Athens. The Persians under Xerxes had been advancing with great success through Greece, and in 480 BC they had captured Athens. Both Greek and Persian supplies were running low, and there was disagreement among the Greeks as to what their next move should be. And some advocated withdrawal to Corinth. However, the Athenian general um, Themistocles argued that it would be uh, far more effective to pursue an aggressive naval policy and hold their position. And when he threatened to leave with an Athenian navy, the rest of the Greek force agreed to his plan. By some accounts, um, he sent a secret message to Xerxes saying that his Athenian navy was prepared to turn against the rest of the Greeks and that the Persians had only to attack to secure a victory. And so Xerxes, who is perhaps fooled by this ploy, he attacked with his fleet of about 400 ships. When the Persian navy advanced, the fleet of about 380 Greek ships backed further into the bay, a tactical maneuver designed to draw in the Persians. And so crowded in the narrow straits of Salamis, the Persian ships were rammed, sunk, or boarded by the Greeks for hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. And so the battle was a decisive victory for the outnumbered Greeks, who lost only about 40 ships, compared to more than 200 lost by the Persians. And this halted the advance of Xerxes and it ended the Persian threat to Greek civilization. And the Battle of Placia, the final battle of the Persian Wars, in which the remaining Persian forces in Greece were defeated and they were driven out. And so all authority comes from God. Pharaoh had to learn that lesson in Egypt the hard way in Exodus 7. Nebuchadnezzar had to learn it in Babylon in Daniel chapter 3 and 4. Belshazzar learned it in his blasphemous banquet in Daniel 5. Sennacherib learned it at the gates of Jerusalem uh, with, in Isaiah 36 and 37 when the uh, angel came out and slaughtered 185,000 after dinner. And so Herod Agrippa I learned it as he died being eaten by worms in Acts 12. And the U.S. may be learning that lesson right now, Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 32, right? When we keep embracing immorality, God may turn away from us, and certainly he will. And so after these battles, the king came home to a bitter man, uh, or he came home a bitter man. And so, and it was only, a, it was only natural that he would s seek and s find some kind of comfort in his own home. Right, so he, I bring all this history up so you know he's coming back from all this massive defeat, humiliated, um, and so. But then he remembered that Vashti had been dethroned and he was without a queen. All right, and so Xerxes invaded Greece with an army. It said of more than two million soldiers, only about five thousand of whom returned with him. And it was after his return from this disastrous invasion that Esther was chosen as his queen. In 478 BC, he will live another 13 years. She will live into the reign of her stepson, Artaxerxes, and Nehemiah's request to rebuild Jerusalem. All right, and you'll study Daniel's 70 weeks for the profound significance of that event. All right, verse 5 through 7. In Shushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up uh, Hadessa, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. And so Mordecai, this cousin of Esther, he came to Persia in one of the waves of relocation that the Babylonians imposed on Judah when it conquered that land. Esther, whose Jewish name uh, Hadassah means myrtle, the Persian name Esther means star. It was, she was raised by her cousin Mordecai since the death of her father and mother. And so in prophetic symbolism, the myrtle would replace the briars and thorns of the desert, so depicting the Lord's forgiveness and acceptance of his people. Isaiah 41, 55, and Zechariah chapter 1, verse 8. And so they were part of this large Jewish community that was forced to relocate out of Judah and didn't decide to return with Ezra. So in the day of Mordecai and Esther, the land of Judah was regarded as a wild and backward place. 
And so the Hebrew for lovely and beautiful is literally beautiful in form and lovely to look at, or as the NIV will have it, lovely in form and features. And so we regard that the Bible is generally given in, uh, to understatement. And so when it says that Esther was lovely and beautiful, we know that it's not exaggerating. Uh, she must have been extremely thus so. And so let's look at this character Shimei, right? Um, you'll note this character, the son of Shimei, Mordecai's son of Shimei, Pay attention to this. This will blow your mind. So Shimei, as also Saul, the son of Kish of the tribe of Benjamin, uh, Josephus will refer to Esther as part of the royal family. And so Shimei was the son of Gera, a Benjamite of Saul's house. So you'll remember when David, when he was fleeing from Absalom, he reached the edge of the valley between the road and Shimei's house. Shimei ran along the ridge over against the road, cursing and throwing stones and dust at him and his mighty men uh, as he went along saying come out come out thou bloody man thou man of uh, Belial the Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul and the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son and behold thou art taken in thy mischief because thou art a bloody man that's in 2 Samuel 16 verses 5 through 13 he's referring to his hanging up Saul's sons for the Gibeonites in 2 Samuel 21 which in time preceded this also to his general engagement in wars in 1 Chronicles 22. And so Abishai would have taken off his head, right? One of David's mighty men right then and there as a dead dog, uh, presuming to curse the king. But David felt that it was Jehovah's doing. He said, let him curse for the Lord hath bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on in China affliction and requite me good for his cursing. So Shimei wisely was the first of the house of Joseph to meet David on his victorious return over Jordan. Uh, and so a thousand Benjamites and Ziba with his 15 sons and 20 servants were with him. He fell down before the king, confessing his sin and begging David not to impute iniquity to him or remember and to take heart on him on his uh, perversity. Uh, so again, Abishai would have slain Shimei right then and there, but David felt his day of restoration to the kingdom was no day for avenging wrongs. And he said, thou shalt not die. And so the genealogical ironies here is that David's sparing of Shimei resulted in a Mordecai. And Saul's sparing of Agag resulted in a Haman. And we'll get to Haman here in a little bit later. But pay attention. Those decisions that were made way back then, now we're starting to see the repercussions of those decisions uh, or the fruits thereof here in this book. And that's fascinating. And so the deportation under Jeconiah began some 80 years earlier. There were at least three captivities of Judah. The first one was when Daniel was carried away in the third year of Jehoiakim. That's about 605 BC. That's in Daniel 1. The second that is referred to here is when Jehoiachin or Jeconiah was made prisoner eight years later in 597 BC. And the third was when Zedekiah was taken and Jerusalem was burnt, right? Zedekiah had his eyes put out, his son slain, and he was taken away. Um, blind to Babylon and he died there. That's in 586 BC. Kish belonged to the uh, second captivity in 2 Kings 24. Okay. And so um, Gesenius, one of the greatest Hebrew authorities, says that Esther is taken from the word to hide. So it means something hidden. And so Esther, she was a Jewish um, that's named uh, Hadassah, or the myrtle, uh, but when she entered the royal harem, she received the name by which she henceforth became known as Esther. She was the daughter of Abihail, a Benjamite. Her family did not avail themselves of the permission granted by Cyrus to the exiles to return to Jerusalem, and she resided with her cousin Mordecai, who held some office in the household of the Persian king at Shushan in the palace. All right, verse 8. So it was when the king's command and decree were heard that when many young women were gathered at Shushan the citadel under the custody of Haggai, that Esther also was taken into the king's palace into the care of Haggai, the custodian of the women. 
And so it seems that Esther didn't really have a choice about this. And Haggai was the king's eunuch in Esther chapter 2, verse 3, a man entrusted with the oversight of the king's harem for obvious reasons. And so according to Baldwin, Haggai is specifically mentioned by a Greek historian Herodotus as being an officer of King Xerxes. Verse 9. Now the young women pleased him, and she obtained his favor, so he readily gave beauty preparations to her, besides her allowance. Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. All right, so pay attention to the details. We'll start to see God behind all of this. And so Esther obtained favor with Haggai, the man in authority over her. In this, her godliness ensured a fulfillment of Proverbs 3, verse 34, where it says, Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. And so because of this favor, Haggai gave Esther special beauty preparations beyond her allowance. So extra. He also gave her seven choice maidservants to look after her beauty needs. Note the seven. And so Esther was beautiful to begin with. Now she's going to look like one of those after pictures from a glamour photo studio. Um, And she looked that way all the time. And so the ancient Hebrew word for beauty preparations comes from the root to scour, to polish. Verse 10 and 11. Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. And every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. So normally, there was never a good reason for hiding the fact that, you know, we are Christians. Far too many Christians act as if they're secret agents, and they always conceal who they are in the Lord. And we must take the warning that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33 seriously, where he says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. We can't live a life of denial and expect God to recognize us. However, we do recognize that there are situations where God may... Uh, have us be uh, reticent about our Christian identity, not for the purposes of permanently concealing it, but waiting for the opportune moment to reveal it. And this book is all about opportune moments. Apparently, this is what Mordecai sensed was right to do in this circumstance, and Esther agreed with him. For example, in some situations, one might initially act if they know nothing when approached by a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, uh, and do not, and they, they do it not to deny Jesus, but to seize a strategic opportunity. And so Mordecai's great interest in Esther's state shows his love and concern for her in such a potentially dangerous place. Verse 12 through 14. Each young woman's turn came to go into King Xerxes after she had completed 12 months preparation, according to the regulations for the women, for thus were the days of their preparation appointed, six months with the oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. Thus prepared, each young woman went to the king, and she was given wherever she desired to take with her from the women's quarters to the king's palace. In the evening she went, and in the morning she returned to the second house of the woman, to the custody of the Sheshgaz. And the king's eunuch who kept the concubines, she would not go in to the king again unless the king delighted in her and called her uh, by name. And so Persia was one of the many countries famous for its aromatic perfumes and ancient customs for the preparations of brides, including ritualistic baths, plucking of the eyebrows, the painting of hands and feet with henna or facial makeup, and the applications of beautifying paste all over the body meant to lighten the color of the skin and to remove spots and blemishes. And so one reason for the lengthy time of preparation was to tell if the women had been pregnant upon coming into the harem so that the king would not be charged with fathering a child that was not his. And so Matthew Poole will say that the oils and perfumes were necessary because the bodies of men and women in those hot countries did of themselves yield very ill scents, if not corrected and qualified uh, by art. And so... (laughs) 
And as a person that spent a lot of time in the Middle East, that is still true today. And so it sounds wonderful, a year of constant spa treatments, yet the destiny of these women should also be considered here. One evening with the king, if he chose them from the 400 others to be his queen, then she would be his companion until she displeased him. As for the 399 others who lost, they were banished to the harem where they stayed the wife or the concubine of the king but rarely, if ever, saw him afterwards. And they were never free to marry another man, essentially living as a perpetual widow. Verse 15 through 18. Now when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to King Xerxes into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tibeth, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the other virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Ashti. Then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther, for all his officials and servants, and he proclaimed the, a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. And so Esther's humble wisdom was shown in the way that she allowed the custodian of the women to assist her preparations. Uh, she obtained favor in the sight of everyone. This is because of both Esther's godliness and beauty. Beauty often gains people, especially women, favor with others. This is a fact that Christians must accept, wisely teaching their children what really matters and refusing to rely too much on beauty for our judgment of people, right? <clears throat> for, that's direction towards both boys and girls. And so, because of the great favor she obtained with the king, Esther was selected to be the queen of this king Xerxes. Esther's life so far has been remarkable. She was the child of Jewish exiles who both died, and she was raised by her cousin in a foreign and often hostile land. She was taken by compulsion into the king's harem, and she found favor with all whom she met, and she was finally selected to be the queen of the realm. This remarkable course of events wasn't an accident. It wasn't just because of luck or fortune on, or, you know, Esther's good looks or sparkling personality, God had a plan and Esther is part of it. In Psalm 75 or 6 and 8 or 6 through 7 will say, For exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. In exactly the same way, we have a place in God's plan. Wherever you are right now, God has a purpose for it. Maybe it's a short purpose or a long one. Perhaps it's a large purpose or a small purpose, but God has a reason. So to this point, the story of Esther also shows us that in the outworking of his plan, God can use the evil of man. God did not make uh, Xerxes drunk or make him demand that his queen present him, uh, herself in an immodest way before the lords of the kingdom. Yet God allowed this wicked action of man to fulfill a purpose in his greater plan. We find assurance in the truth that no other person, no matter how evil they are, can defeat God's plan for our life no matter what they've done to you or will do to you. All right, verse 19 and 20. When virgins were gathered together a second time, Mordecai sat within the king's gate. Now Esther had not revealed her family and her people, just as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. So this position within the king's gate will indicate that Mordecai was associated with the decision makers and uh, men of influence in the kingdom. Some have thought that the book of Esther carries the idea of concealment too far. This book has been criticized because it doesn't mention the name of God, as neither does the Song of Solomon, which is another great book, uh, full of insights for Christ's love for the church. And some will say that the name of God was left out of the book of Esther because of its use in the festivities surrounding Purim, where people commonly became drunk. One rabbi taught a man is obligated to drink on Purim until he's unable to distinguish between blessed be Mordecai and cursed be Haman. And some have wondered if, in that atmosphere, it would be too easy to profane the name of God if it were to be read at such a festival. And so others will see the name of Yahweh hidden in the acrostics, based on the initial and final letters of successive words in chapter 120, chapter 5, 4, chapter 5, 13, and chapter 7, verse 7. In some manuscripts, the letters in these words are written a bit larger to give them prominence. 
And perhaps also the book of Esther does not contain the name of God because it was written under Persian rule and for distribution in the Persian Empire. Most likely, the book of Esther doesn't have the name of God because it shows how God works behind the scenes. God is always active in Esther, even if it's behind the scenes. You actually, the more you look at it, the more you see God all over this book. Verse 21 through 23. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, uh, Bethan and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Xerxes. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on a gallows. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. All right. And pay attention to this. This will come up later. And so Mordecai's attitude wasn't, I'm a Jewish man in exile under a pagan king, so I don't care if he is killed. Instead, he fulfilled Peter's thought in 1 Peter 2, verse 17, before Peter ever wrote it, fear God, honor the king. And so this threat of assassination was real, obviously. Xerxes was eventually murdered by his prime minister who placed Artaxerxes I on the throne. And so both were hanged on a gallows. The word gallows is literally tree. The idea that they were hanged on a tree probably refers not to hanging with a noose around the neck, but the impalement of a stake, much like crucifixion. Right? The Persians came up with crucifixions. The Romans later would perfect it and came up with the cross. <clears throat> but here in the book of Esther, we will see it's really a, pale, uh, a pole, an impalement on a stake that goes up through your rear end and typically out your neck. And so a pointed stake is set upright in the ground. The culprit is taken, placed on a sharp point, and then pulled down by his legs till the stake that went in at the fundament passes up through the body and comes out through the neck. Uh, it's a most dreadful species of punishment in which revenge and cruelty may glut the utmost of their malice. And so the culprit lives a considerable time in excruciating agonies. All right. In the next session, we'll talk about the wrath of the Amalekite. And you'll, you should study Esther chapter 3 and 4. It'll be an introduction of the villain of the peace. And we'll see in Haman's background. Check out 1 Samuel 15. But here the thread begins in Genesis and also involves a notable ancestor of Mordecai's family, the first king of Israel, Mordecai's background in 2 Samuel 16, 19, and 1 Kings 2. All right? And you can find more study material at taylorbiblestudy.com.